friends, I'm Sharon Betters, and this is the Help and Hope podcast, and we are so excited today to have with us Katie Bowser Hudson. But before I tell you about Katie, I want to ask you a question. What would you do? How would you feel if you heard your doctor say, without treatment, this disease is fatal? Well, Katie heard those words, and as she has shared in her book, she didn't hear any optimism in her doctor's voice. And so within days, she was um, in the middle of very aggressive treatment for a very aggressive breast cancer. As a breast cancer uh, survivor, and I I don't even like to say survivor, I like the uh, idea of warrior woman. Um, I had breast cancer over 30 years ago. And I had to have aggressive treatment, uh, but nothing like what Katie has experienced. Uh, So I know that her story is going to encourage you in your own walk. I know that also every warrior woman I know who is battling or has battled breast cancer will resonate with the title of her book where she says, now I lay myself down to fight. And so Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sharon. I'm so glad to be with you. Well, I think, um, you know, for me personally, as I was learning about your story, uh, the phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times came to me (laughs) Um, because you were describing a really uh, just a spectacular time in your life. It seemed like uh, the culmination of a lot of dreams and a new chapter opening up for you. And then within hours, uh, everything turned upside down. What happened? You know, um, just side note, I haven't even started talking. I'm already on a side note. Here we go, Sharon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is when people ask how I'm doing, I often answer like that. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. No kidding. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, goodness. Dickens. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, let's see what happened. I was, um, I was 40 that year. I'm 46 now. I had to think about that a second. Um, and my, and we were in a busy time of life. Um, I have a husband who's a touring musician Mm. and, um, my kids were six years old and three years old. And I've, um, I've been a writer and a musician my whole life. So Mm. I had done various projects. Kenny, my husband and I had played music together and I had done jazz for kids and Bible songs for kids. Um, but Kenny was on the road a lot and I was home with our two littles and it was, there were so many good things going on, but it was so much. And as any artist with kids knows, um, you have to work really hard to keep that part of yourself. Um, and it's also really important to keep that part of yourself. So I was doing, uh, so I was writing um, between things while the kids were there, just trying to find ways to keep going. And a friend told me about a scholarship that was specifically for artists with young children. Hmm. Uh, and so I ended up getting a scholarship to go to Martha's, Martha's Vineyard for um, a writing um, a writing institute for a week uh, to go study poetry, which hmm. was it really was idyllic. It was pretty wonderful. So I went up there, another friend, um, I encouraged her and she ended up getting a scholarship as well. So I took a road trip with a dear friend and was on Martha's Vineyard for a week with goodness, with cows and sheep and staying in this beautiful artist loft and wa- and walking to the bus every day to go to the seashore, to go study with artists and walking along the sea and writing and soaking this all in and making a plan for my work when I got home and it was lovely. And then I got on the ferry at the end of the week and we went to go um, stay with friends in Boston. And that night I took a shower and I looked, I caught myself in the mirror and I realized that my right breast was hot and swollen and puckered. Like the skin was thick, which is hard to explain. Now I know it's called um, poto orange, which is orange peel skin. I'm not sure if I've gotten there. I've heard many versions of that French pronunciation there, but, um, but I, I, I Googled, you know, like anyone would do. Uh, I, I had seen it a week or two before and thought it was maybe a rash or something. I have sensitive skin, but this was definitely angry. And my two options that I could find on, you know, Dr. Internet Mm -hmm. were 
um, mastitis and I wasn't nursing anymore or uh, inflammatory breast cancer, which is a very rare and very aggressive cancer that multiplies in days and weeks. Uh, like, and so I went to pick my kids up in Pennsylvania where they were staying with my parents. Kenny was on the road and I said, I'm just going to go hop in and get a mammogram. So I went into the little, uh, the little hospital in my parents' small town, uh, where they were kind of annoyed that I was coming in with a last minute mammogram at the end of the day. Uh, and after I got the mammogram, uh, my, my tech got a little more, uh, gentle <laughs> and then I got an ultrasound, uh, and then they, they let me know that, yeah, I did in fact have, it sure looked like inflammatory breast cancer. So wow. from that, yeah, at that point we were running for it. Um, it was straight back to Nashville, back home, uh, and straight into chemo straight, just, we went, we went into gear, um, really, really quick because it really was running for my life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, as I was, uh, reading your beautiful book of poetry, I, I was thinking that it was relentless. It was like you said, it was chasing you. It was oh, just good work. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you had no choice but to take action right away. Well, I was uh, 39 years old when I was diagnosed huh. with um, breast cancer. And I had two elementary children and two high school kids. And wow. I remember exactly, my husband was the one who told me that, uh, that I, I had a malignancy. And I remember how I felt. I, I remember everything. Tell us about when you knew, I mean, you, the tech told you, how did your body, your mind, your heart, um, respond. Boy, sometimes I'm going to have to get your story here too, Sharon. <laughs> I'm a uh, whoo because I, I can. That that sounds pretty familiar. Um, you know what? When when I found out um, when I when I found out that they actually when they actually said that it was cancer. Actually, the first thing I did was get out my notepad. I completely stuffed my emotions because mm -hmm. that's not what I needed right then. I needed information as much as I could get and fast. So I pulled out my notebook and I started writing everything down mm -hmm. um, and asking every question that I could possibly think of because I needed to know as much as I could to find out what the next steps were. Um, after that, I went to the car, called my husband and started sobbing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he found a way to get home as quickly as he could. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to my parents' house. I, I called my parents first to let them know what was coming. Um, and that was really hard. My dad, um, man, my dad is a, a, a was a colonel in the army and um, a fairly um, a, a fairly uh, not obviously emotional guy. <laughs> and he was he was standing there. I mean, just about at attention, waiting for me with tears running down his face. Aww. Ooh, that that got me. <laughs> getting me. But, uh, <laughs> yes. And I was still trying to hold it together at that point because uh -huh. my kids came running out and I had to explain and they wanted to know why grandpa was crying. Uh -huh. And so, you know, as a mom, I, I put it all back in and I said, um, I, um, have something that's called cancer. There is something in my, I said, I don't feel sick at all right now. I remember this pretty clearly. Um, I don't feel sick at all right now, but there's something in my, in my body and in my breast that's trying to hurt me. And so I have to go, um, this year I've got to do a bunch of treatment. I have to go get medicines be, and guess what? So I don't feel sick right now, but this is going to make me feel sick, um, to make this thing in my body that's hurting me go away. So sometimes I'm going to be really tired and my hair's going to fall out. And my daughter who is six laughed. She's like, what in the world? <laughs> and I said, and so I have, I said, so my big job right now is I have to go, um, take medicine and do these things to get better. Uh, yeah, that's how I explained wow. it to them at six and three. Yeah. I didn't need to say mama might die. That was not what they needed to hear. They needed to hear, I'm going right. to be sick, I'm going to be tired, and we're going to be working hard. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I resonate with you saying I felt fine. I remember for myself, I had to have six months of uh, chemotherapy. It was a long time ago. Mm. So we, 
I had to go into the hospital for four days a month. Every four weeks, I'd be in the hospital. And oh, the goodness. nurses would sometimes wear three pairs of rubber gloves so that the poisons mm -hmm. they were putting into my body did not touch their <laughs> hands. So yeah. that gave me a good idea of what was going on. But Ugh. I would feel fine. And uh, I'd have to go in, and I knew that within 24 hours of going home, I was going to be a mess. And mm -hmm. every four weeks, I would say that to my husband, I feel fine. I don't feel like there's anything wrong with me. But mm -hmm. thank God for the kind of medical testing and everything that we have. Um, so you mentioned treatment. What, what was your uh, treatment plan? Well, inflammatory breast cancer is a little bit different in terms of the order of things for, for most folks with breast cancer. Um, it's called neoadjuvant chemo. Um, mm -hmm. so I, so chemo is the first thing you do. So they put a port in on my clavicle. I cried when they told me they were going to put it on my right side because, um, my son wasn't nursing anymore, but he still snuggled on that side. Mm -hmm. It was pretty close still. My little, my mm -hmm. little two year old. Um, and so they put it on the other side for me. And that was the day I realized that I could ask for things. I didn't know if they could do it. Mm. But I said, it, can you put it on the other side? She's like, the nurse is like, well, let me ask. And they could. Mm. So that was the day I started to learn to ask for what I hoped for and what I wanted and yeah. what I needed. So I got a port in, um, had chemo. Um, after chemo, I had a double mastectomy. Um, and I, by the way, decided to stay flat. And that's a whole discussion that um, it, there was, I, for one thing, I just didn't want any more surgery. I was just over that. And also mm -hmm. I didn't want anything, especially with my kind of cancer that could mask or complicate seeing any future recurrences. So it also makes running easier. <laughs> There's that. Um, so there was no, there was no actual benefit for me physically to keeping my breasts at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and, and there was a possible risk. So I was like, let it go. Um, and then I had radiation and then I had both of my ovaries taken out, um, to continue to reduce estrogen. Cause I had a, my cancer ate estrogen. So yeah, and that's yeah, most that's of it. A lot. Yeah. That's a lot. You, that was a lot, but here you are. And mm -hmm. how do you feel today? Um, I, I feel pretty great. <laughs> you know, but I feel really great compared to when I was in treatment, which was, which really was really hard. And a lot of the hard is just the, the cumulative downhill of getting just beat down a treatment at a time. It's exhausting. Yeah. I think the yeah. long term, but today, um, you know, I still have things that are there. Like, um, my, I can't quite feel the tips of my toes. Um, mm -hmm. chemo gave me a little neuropathy, but it's actually improving all the time over the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. Um, my, um, I have a little lymphedema in my arm, so it, it swells because they had to take a bunch of lymph nodes, but I had a crazy surgery where I have, I've had a lymph node transfer. I've had lymph nodes transplanted from another part of my body to under my arm. So it's actually, wow. yeah, that's a thing. Um, I wish more people knew about that. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, I have, I have scarring where I, my, my skin is still kind of stuck to my chest a little bit in spots, but, yeah. um, but also, and, but how about this? I, I'm always gonna kind of feel a little worn out because that kind of put me through it. I have a poem where I say, um, I have a poem called washcloth where it talks about feeling like a worn out, mm. um, dried out washcloth. That's never quite going to be square again. Yeah. yeah. I remember the doctor telling me at, le at least a year before you start feeling a little normal, you're going to be mm. exhausted, but it does last a while. It, it definitely does last a long time. Yes. Um, one of the things that you said I resonate with is you, you found out that you could ask, for things to be done a specific way. And I remember everybody that walked into my hospital room, I would have a list of questions. Even though I had asked the person before all those questions, I would ask the, the same questions to another person because I always learned something more. Oh, and well helped, done. Yeah, it helped me. So I always recommend that. And like you said, you had a notebook, recommend notebooks too, to jot down all the questions. So. Yes. And also, if yeah, if you have those questions beforehand, then when you're, you have a busy doctor who comes in and you're feeling deer in the headlights, then you have them. And it also lets them know, I don't want you to go until I have the answers to these questions. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 You learn, you learn the ins and outs of, 
<laughs> and most mm-hmm. people are very willing to most most healthcare people are very willing to answer questions and to to make you feel comfortable. So, yeah, but it's a foreign land. It's it's just a total uh, foreign land, and it takes yeah. a while to get acclimated yeah. to it. My one other but, oh, go yeah. ahead. I was going to say my one other big life hack w- was learning to say I want an attending physician. Um, not a resident. Um, mm. Residents are wonderful and there are places for that. But when you get stuck a lot, um, it is okay to ask for yes. somebody who does this all the time. Yes. Hallelujah, 100%. That was <laughs> <laughs> helpful. I, I mean, and back then, they didn't stop after three times of sticking, you know, trying to find blood and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So it took me a while to realize and to say, okay, you get two chances and then you're done. Um, Mm -hmm. I want somebody else, but yeah, Yeah. I totally agree on that. Um, you were, your faith, you, you're a believer, a Christian, Mm -hmm. your whole life, uh, seems like it was in sharing that faith with others through your music and writing. And, um, how did this impact your faith? Uh, your whole world being turned upside down, you're a young mother and you, and you knew that you still might not recover from this, it still could win. So how, how, how did you navigate all of that? Um, Well, how about I'll start with, um, you know, it's when you said, how did that impact your faith? Um, You know, I I almost, (laughs) I almost want to flip it and say, how did my faith impact this? Um, And and it did impact my faith, of course, but, Mm -hmm. um, but coming into this, realizing, um, realizing that, okay, now I'm looking death in the face real close. Mm. Um, what I realized um, pretty quickly was that the things that I believed were true, um, this didn't change anything mm. uh, in the sense that um, I've always believed, I- I've always known I'm going to die sometime. I've always believed um, that Jesus comes close in hard things. And thankfully, I've been been taught that. And also that Christians will go through hard things. I haven't been taught that, that Christians walk through this world without trouble. And that if you do, that, that you did something wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus is really clear that he came in this world and had a lot of trouble. Um, and that, and the people who follow him and, and for that matter, everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, it's not a, a special lot for, well, there's some things that are special lot for mm. Christians, but if you're in this world, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. Um, and so I think what it did was let me know in deep new ways that Jesus comes very close and hard and sorrowful things mm. and that the Holy Spirit is a real comfort in the middle of the hardest things. And there are some ways that you can only know um, exactly how kind God is um, when you're in the middle of, of hard things that are absolutely beyond your control. So that's yeah. part of why, yeah, my book is, a, so now I lay me down to fight. My, my friend Margie has this wonderful saying um, to collapse into Jesus's marvelous hands. Mm. And there are points where, um, there are points where you are more cognizant that all you can do is collapse. Yeah, that's, I love that. That's beautiful. Um, our 16 year old son, Mark and his friend Kelly were in a fatal car accident. And so that put me on the trajectory of trying to figure out what, what I believed was it true. Um, and one of the parts, one of the hard parts for me was wrestling uh, to reconcile his love with his sovereignty. You know, how mm-hmm. did it, go together and it was a gift for me to have that struggle because as as you said you collapse into the love of Jesus running toward him with all of these hard places and I think that I love what you're saying is that these hard places are opportunities to understand better his love and his grace and his um, total acceptance of, of where we are because of what he did because of his love for us. So I, I love your perspective on that. That is well, beautiful. And, I mean, I'll, I'll add all the caveats, Sharon, that just like you said, you that happens through wrestling too. I have a yeah. poem that's called Frustration and um, it's saying I'm frustrated. And what I'm trying to say by that is not uh, that I just feel frustrated, it's that you have frustrated me. Like that God has actively um, 
yeah, it's not as though I'm out of his hand. And I'm not saying that God makes bad things happen, but also God certainly um, has not kept all bad things out of my life. Right. Um, and so that that's why I do poetry, um, mm-hmm. because it's, it's where I can wrestle. And it's where I can get really honest. And um, poetry in particular is... Um, an avenue for me where I can really get down to language that really um, gets down to brass tacks. So. And it does. And I want to tell you, listeners, um, we like to say we want our conversations to be like salty peanuts. We want you to want more. We can't possibly go over everything that's in this incredible <laughs> book. So we want you to get this book and we'll have information in the show notes. But uh, when I lay my, when I lay myself down it's a, you know what you know the the children's like now i lay me down to sleep it's yes. now yeah it's now, now i lay I me lay down, down to fight to fight yeah mm-hmm. now i lay me down to fight um it's beautifully written and she and our our guest is transparent she's very transparent if you have been anywhere near suffering you're going to capture what she is saying um katie it's really beautiful i'm so grateful for it and i think sometimes we um as believers we get mixed up for instance the beautiful verse in romans 8 where it says all things work together for good for those who love the lord and i um the older i get the more i realize it's about becoming more like jesus what could be better than becoming more like him through those hard places? And those hard places show us uh, how much we need him and how much we need to run to him and turn to him. So that's one of the good things that comes from those hard places. So. Okay, so Sh- Sharon, you, I'm going to jump to, I, you, t- you, you tipped your hand and told me a f- few things we might talk about, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and call it Providence that you went for Romans 8, because that's okay. where I was just hanging out this morning and I was going, where do, um, like when you were asking like, what came from this, what's come out of it, um, but, uh, or what would you, oh, how I forget how you said it, but what's kind of your takeaway and the, or what would you get? I think you said, what would you tell someone in the middle of this? Mm-hmm. Um, and I was going, oh, Romans 8, 26 and 27 is um, the spirit helps us in our weakness. And we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit mm-hmm. himself intercedes for us with groans that words can't express. So I, I mean, I love that that's right up against it. Those two things are together. Yeah. It's like, I have no idea what to pray for right now, but yeah. I do know that the, um, the spirit, um, that the Holy spirit will, um, will come near and help us figure that out when we don't have words. Yeah. 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 I definitely remember those moments during chemo where I was so sick and lost my hair. And, um, you know, I started out with I, the two things I really can't stand. One thing is I can't stand needles. And the other is I don't want to throw up. Mm -hmm. chemo is that's a definite you're gonna well maybe not today maybe it's so much better today but back then that was as much as they tried it it wasn't going to be overcome and Uh, and getting stuck with needles all the time i'm um, with you yeah those hard places yeah needles and and needles and nausea are just both and Uh and it just wears you down uh to the point yeah i mean you had two little children how in the world did you take care of them and uh, in the middle of all of this, I know what it feels like. And, I mean, and you probably felt worse because yours was much more aggressive. But you were just talking, work? yeah. You were just talking about the about nausea and vomiting. I I have a poem in here um, where I'm. It's just a moment where I was potty training my son in the early hours of the morning, and he was sitting on the potty, and I was about to throw up, and I was like, "Am I going to have to push him off? Like, what are we?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like how do we do this at the same time yeah um how about this i parented with with a whole lot of help and i know that's not true for everyone the minute um i when i picked up my kids in pennsylvania and went home to meet kenny in nashville my mom joined me in the car and my dad stayed behind mm-hmm. um shut down the house got um got their airstream up and running and they came and parked in the yard for nine or ten months Wow. Um, they wow. just, w- it guess. wasn't even a thought. Um, they, they moved in and in the morning they get up 
and have their coffee and watch the news and come in and take care of us all day and go back out and have a glass of wine. Um, Perfect. They, and so it was, it was so grateful. So yeah, my mom learned how to homeschool a little bit on days where I couldn't with my first grader. What a and, gift. Yes. And um, my dad puttered around and fixed everything in the house, I think. Mm. Um, Mm. But uh, yeah, and Kenny still went on the road a lot of it. His boss was really grateful. He played with a guy named, um, do you know who David Crowder is? He's a Christian worshiper. Of course. Of okay. Course. Uh, Crowder was unbelievably generous and mm. was very kind. And um, yeah, when Kenny needed to stay home, Kenny stayed home. Wow. So That's yeah. amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And I, I would say to those of you who are listening, if you're, you're thinking, well, I don't have a family like that. I would be mm. by myself. I believe that's why God, one of the reasons God has given us the covenant family, the church Absolutely. family. Um, and I know that's hard. I, I was a pastor's wife for many, many years, and I know that we can be deeply wounded um, by the church family and we wound others. But I still believe it's one of God's most precious gifts. And I also believe that's where he keeps a lot of his promises yes. of, um, that he, he gives to us through his people. And so mm -hmm. in the good times or the bad times, it's worth it to pursue that uh, relationship with, yeah. with God's people. Yeah, yeah I'll say right. our, our friends and our, our church, our church friends and our friends and community um, brought us meals every day for about nine months. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the amount of weight that they lifted um, was, was huge. Yes. Just in those, those little everyday things and keeping up yeah. with us was, was yes, they were definitely the hands and feet of Christ to us. Yeah. yeah. I was teaching a women's Bible study and um, one of the women organized a group of women to come over and clean my house, which I did not want them to do because as you can imagine, oh, yes. kids, and, and I was like, I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. And she said, we are coming. It's and so we are hard to accept it. House, so whether you like it or not, we're coming. You are now cancer free, which is pretty amazing. But as someone who is also cancer free, I know that the first, 10 years or so, um, every time you have to have a test, there is this feeling. How, how do you deal with the, the potential for living in fear? Uh, <laughs> that you, uh, because it's just there. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's just there. Um, and it, and it gets less. So the more you live in today's where, um, where you've lived another day. Mm. Um, but it, yes, and you take it to Jesus and you go check the things out. Um, what was I? Oh, oh, you know what the next book I want to write is about? I want to write about playfulness. There you go. That's I've been, uh, yeah, I've been um, thinking about it and studying it, but uh so I had, you know, my trauma with cancer and the whole world has gone through uh, mm. a pandemic now. Uh, yeah. So a global trauma of sorts, but it feels like there's, uh, yeah, I think one of the best ways to respond to trauma um, is play really. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I don't, and play doesn't always just mean fun. That's kind of something I've been kicking around lately that, mm. um, Play is stepping forward in faith with, with some trust and levity and um, exploring the edges of what you know to be true and what you feel like is true and trusting that God will go over there with you. So I've been kicking around how, um, I mean, the, the Trinity is playful among mm -hmm. itself, themselves, um, and it's, it, God is playful with us, um, calls us into places to find things that are true um, in the face of fear. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait <laughs> to get your book. <laughs> it, it's a, it is a big way that I've, that I've responded to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, don't you think that, I mean, one of the things I was going to say is after every test you celebrate, you know, when you get your bones mm -hmm. and they say everything's clear, we would celebrate yes. that. that would be amazing. Um, talking oh, about playfulness, if you're, you have a, a to-do list and your husband comes and says, 
you want to run errands with me or do you want to take the kids to the beach or whatever? You put everything aside and yes. you do it. You go for it. Um, so mm. I, but I also love the way you're talking about the playfulness of learning more really about the character of God and uh, some of the, the deep secrets that he, he has that he shows us in the darkness. Um, so, but we celebrate with you that you are cancer free um, and know that I, I know that there's at least one more book inside of you, but I have a feeling there's more than that. So speaking about your books, uh, we're going to be wrapping up our time together, but I was hoping you could read one of your, what's one of your favorite poems in your book? Well, I've got one here. I've got one for you. Okay. Um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a good intro one because this is, it's called Cancer Poet. And this is, um, this is a direct talk to cancer. Mm -hmm. So by the way, do you know what kudzu is? You're, are you in Delaware? Is that right? Uh, I'm in Florida right now, but we are oh. from Delaware. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Um, hooray for Florida. Um, yes. Well, okay. So you, you know what kudzu is? The invasive thing that takes over everything. We call it kudzilla sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes an appearance in this, in this poem. Um, okay. Cancer poet. Cancer is an overgrowth, a kudzu, tangling mm -hmm. and strangling legitimate life. Chemo is a killing, a burning out, burning down to ashy carbon indiscriminately. Hmm. But cancer, did you know that I am a poet? My job is to cull through the chaos with tweezers and magnifier. I have wings on shoulder blades and ankles just big enough for hovering me inches above the terrain, traversing hmm. without smothering my subject. With pen and pocket and fingers and eyes, I cipher meaning, siphoning liquid beauty that seeps from the edges into a tiny vial, taking pains with my pain. It fruits sweetly. Hmm. If in this year's ravaging, I eke an ounce of beauty, it will outweigh all of your ashy remnant. I can, post it on, I can paste it on my foot soles and stick me to the incinerated earth while I wait, where I will wait for the rich loam tear soaked and fertile to live. That is what poets do cancer. That is beautiful. And what a wonderful introduction to your book. Now I lay me down to fight. I'm just loving Katie that our conversation and we could just keep talking. But as we wrap mm -hmm. up, uh, first of all, don't forget salty peanuts. You need to get this book, whether you have breast cancer or not, but it would be a, a very special gift to a woman who is who is in that battle uh, or one who has won the battle, has come through the battle. It's a beautiful book and, and you will resonate with it so much, especially if you have been through this battle or going through it. As we wrap up, Katie, what uh, encouragement would you give to this a woman who has maybe she just learned that she has breast cancer, she's just starting the journey and she's terrified and, and doesn't even know the first step to take? Oh, let people help you and um, know that God does come close mm -hmm. in very hard things. I think especially he comes very close to us when we're wounded um, and it is okay. Yeah, it's okay to lay down and it's okay mm -hmm. to, um, to, 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 feel love and know that you are um yeah that you are precious god cares for your body cares for your soul and um yeah receive all the love that that god and your community have for you um yeah and um go go slow be real gentle with mm -hmm. yourself yeah. I think I think that's really important. What you're saying is to go slow and be gentle with yourself. Uh, give yourself time. And I, again, I go back to the title of your book. Now I lay me down to fight. So when you're laying down, that doesn't mean you're not fighting. You're giving mm -hmm. your body the opportunity to recover and all yes. this. Thing. So Absolutely. like I said, we could just keep on talking, but uh, we need to wrap it up. And I, I want you all to know I've had Katie Bowser Hudson as our guest, and she has written this beautiful book of poetry. Now I lay me down to fight. 
And as I've said, I hope I hope our conversation is like salted peanuts. You want to hear more from Katie uh, and you'll get the book. We'll have the information in our show notes. Is there anywhere else that uh, people could connect with you that um, I, you have a website or? Yep. Uh, you- yeah, I'm on I'm on socials. Um, uh, I hang out mostly, I guess, on Instagram these days. Threads is a thing. I like that. Um, and um, katiehudson.com. KatieHudson.com. Yeah. And we'll with, have the, that with the T if it helps you find it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. H U T S O N. All right. Thank you, Katie, so much uh, for you, being Sharon. with us today. I'm Sharon Batters, and you have been listening to the Help and Hope podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. And what a privilege it has been to have Katie Bowser Hudson as our guest today, the author of Now I Lay Me Down to Fight. Um, you can learn more about Katie uh, by, by looking through our show notes. We have links there to her book and to her website. I also hope that you'll check out helpandhopenow.org, which is our website. You're going to find loads and loads of free resources designed to help turn your heart toward Jesus. And you can download our free app, the Help and Hope app, uh, and make sure you allow for notifications so you don't miss one new resource. Thanks so much for joining us, and I look forward to being with you again.